now everyone, Bad Batch is back for its final season. We got a three episode drop to kick things off. So before we get into this deep dive breakdown, spoilers, spoilers, there will be spoilers. All right, to kick things off, let's do a little review. I guess I'll review the entire premiere, so all three episodes at once. I dug it. First two episodes, a little slow, kind of getting that slow burn out there, laying down all the narratives that need to be followed throughout the season, while also catching us up on what has happened since last season. But man, episode three, Shadows of Tantis, really started to hit the Bad Batch stride, as we like to say here at the SWTS. I just love the tension throughout that episode. Obviously, Palpatine, the project, Necro drop, uh, the, the whole motif they did with the centrifuge and the tension that kind of ratcheted up like, oh, beep, beep, when's it going to get to Omega's vial? Ah, I just, I love that part of episode three. And, and really, I think episode three was the standout episode of the three episode premiere. But in episode one confined, I really appreciated the Groundhog Day feel, you know, the, the kind of another day, another dollar we got to experience for Omega as she seemingly spent up to, upwards of 150 days there on the uh, or in the Mount Tantis detention facility lab, whatever you want to call it. Uh, otherwise, the episode was, was you know, it was kind of slow. The interactions between Omega and Crosshair were definitely choice. I really appreciated those. I love the tone of Crosshair in this, this season. He's defeated. He's broken. He wants to give up. He doesn't want to be redeemed. So I really dug that about episode one. And just kind of touching on their relationship. Because we really never got to see Omega and Crosshair interact much. Um, episode 2, Pass Unknown. I, I like this one a little bit better than Episode 1, but still kind of felt the same. I wouldn't say a, a ton happened, but I really love the Kiner score in Episode 2. It, it had like an alien vibe, maybe a little Predator vibe in there. Just like the drums and the eeriness of that score that Kevin Kiner, his bros, and it looks like another Kiner worked on it as well. Uh, I also appreciated the rescue you know, uh, linking up with some cadets, learning what the Empire was doing with the clone cadets. They essentially were marooning them to die. So obviously we got a little narrative backstory coming at us from E2 as well. And not to mention we get to check in with Hunter and Wrecker, uh, the, the two remaining members of the Bad Batch that aren't incarcerated or doing something with Captain Rex. Uh, but overall, I think the three-episode premiere was the way to go. I don't think uh, airing episode one or two by themselves would have went well with the overall Star Wars fan base. But stringing these three together, it did. It felt like a nice, cohesive jump start to Bad Batch Season 3. With Episode 3, Shadows of Tantus being the shining moment. Of course, you had the palps. You got the, 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 the breakout. And then again, that, that centrifuge tension motif. I loved what they did there. Great choice by the creatives so we're off to a good start bad batch season three i like where we're headed you know we got omega and crosshair they are free but obviously going to be hunted with the full force of the empire and then we have uh, hunter and wrecker with a slight lead at least a sector of where tantus could be so great start to the season love the dark tone love all the tension that has been woven throughout these first three episodes all right, so let's go ahead and get into the top moments from the Bad Batch 3 episode premiere. I'm going to start really with what I was just kind of talking about from episode 1. I really enjoyed the Crosshair and Omega exchanges, mostly because of the tone we were getting from Crosshair. I mean, you can tell this dude is done. He's fried. I mean, he's had his head cooked way back in season 1. He tried to break out in season two. He finally realized that good soldiers don't always have to follow orders, but he's just he's just beat down. Who knows what tests have been done on him? He's got the shaky hand, but uh, in the contrast to that, I also appreciate how Omega is still very bubbly, somewhat cheery, and still very optimistic about their situation. So that dynamic was pretty cool to see. Uh, not to mention the, a, a top moment that kind of goes throughout episode one. It's just that Groundhog Day repetitive feel really dug that uh, way to pass time for omega and crosshair on tantus uh, next hot moment comes from episode two i really really enjoyed the slither vine fight a it was just kind of a cool monster that the empire created but b you got to see the clones work together both at a cadet level and obviously at clone force 99 level it was it's some cool interactions between these bred warriors 
I, I love how the cadets kind of had the change of heart and, and then they couldn't break their that 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 bond they have with their other brother clones uh, visually it was cool you know always like night fights you get the nice pops of color from the blasters the monster looked cool so it looked like something from Lord of the Rings I don't know the Mines of Moria that thing living in in the pond um, and obviously tons of explosions so I'm sure Wrecker appreciated that too but it was just kind of a fun bad batch fight scene. And then the, the rescue at the end with, uh, hey, we've got a new little clone family headed to Pabu. I also have to mark this as a top moment just because of the, the voice acting cameo. But having clone cadet Mox being voiced by Daniel Logan, that was pretty awesome. Uh, if you don't know, Daniel Logan is the actor that played young Boba Fett in Attack of the Clones. And I believe he also voiced him in the Clone Wars episodes that featured a younger Boba Fett. Um, so just had to nod to that as a top moment from that episode. Moving into episode three, a lot more top moments than the first two episodes because of one man and one man only, and that is Palpatine. So got to start with the arrival of Palpatine. Love how it it mirrored what we see in Return of the Jedi when he shows up on Death Star 2. <laughs> you got to love how the Empire... Pulls out the, uh, you know, the, the old dog and pony show when the big boss shows up. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that based on where you work. But they had all the commandos out there, the TKs. Everyone was lined up waiting for the Emperor. And then hearing Ian go into the voice. It was just fantastic. Do it. Uh, just great stuff. Palpatine's arrival. Uh, next top moment, we, we got to talk about the Necromancer room. Yes, they've got a club room, a DJ room, a lab, whatever you want to call it, on Tantus for Project Necromancer. So obviously, I love this moment just for the lore. We have a direct connection now to the Mandoverse era when Project Necromancer was first spoken, I believe by Paleon. We know Brindle Hux is in charge of it. So I love when dots are connected in Star Wars between live action, the Skywalker trilogy, animated series, you name it. It's just a very cool lore moment there. So it was great seeing the Necromancer room. Um, more on that later. I'll talk a bit more maybe on, on the Easter egg stuff. But pretty sure that is full of Jedi specimens. Um, I don't know if they're dead or kept in stasis so their tissue stays well. But it seems they're kind of harvesting them for their, their midichlorian juice and then trying to inject that into clones and seeing if the, the clone architecture, a clone body, if you will, a clone husk, can support the transfusion of midichlorians. And as we found out at the end of episode three, it seems Omega so far is the only clone sample that can accept the transfer of midichlorians or M-count from these specimens in the necromancer room but anyways it was still a cool moment great little lure here and uh, kind of creating that bridge finally to the sequel trilogy specifically the rise of skywalker with palpatine and his clone body all right last top moment here has to be the escape of omega and crosshair it just like in episode two, action packed. You got to see the clones doing their thing. They had another what plan seventy two. You always gotta love when they break out their plans, and you you kind of saw the dynamic between Omega and Crosshair move into a new phase. Uh, there's respect now from him for her. You can see he's like, hey, you got us this far. We're gonna keep going at first. And you know, at first he didn't want to do any of this stuff. So uh, just the the tension, the anxiety around the escape. Uh, coupled with the tension that was being provided from the centrifuge, like I was talking about in my review, I just, I mean, I think without the centrifuge and the click, click, click uh, going throughout this episode, I'm not sure if even this escape would have been as uh, anxiety inducing as it was. So, great top moments in the Bad Batch premiere, and to kind of wrap up this massive breakdown from the SWTS, let's get into some of the eggs and references. Most of these were references, by the way, but you gotta love the old genetic M count, obviously referring to midichlorians. It appears that uh, that's what the Empire is using to discuss what they're doing on Tantus. They're trying to take midichlorians or, or forced DNA from what has to be you know, Jedi's probably in that room in stasis or dead and transferring them into clone bodies. And they're using our existing clones to test 
Will this science work? Can a clone body accept midichlorians or high counts of midichlorians from a force-infused specimen and those midichlorians or the M counts stay at the same number? And as we learned, only Omegas can. And I'm going with that's because she is an unaltered clone. I don't think it has anything to do with, oh, she also has a high midichlorian count. Who knows? We, we know that anyone in the Star Wars galaxy is Force-sensitive. So sure, if you want to say Omega is Force-sensitive, go for it, because so is Sabine. I think it's the, the important thing to pick up here for Project Necromancer is that Omega, Omega's blood, her DNA, that is the key that Palpatine is going to need to be able to transfer his high M-count essence into a clone vessel. So whatever secret in his Omega's blood, and we know she's special. Way back in season one, Lama Su, that's why he sent the bounty hunters after her. When he realized, like, oh crap, we're, we've ran out of that, our, essentially, Django's sample. We no longer have any Django DNA left. We need an, another unaltered version of his DNA, hence Omega. And, uh, and I also think that's why her blood is able to it, take the M-count infusion without it degrading. Okay, so sorry about that, a little tangent. Moving on here, how about those ray shields? Very similar to what we saw on Naboo way back in The Phantom Menace. And you gotta appreciate Omega making a new friend and naming it Batcher. I don't think that uh, was a coincidence. And then finally, from the first episode here, look at that, she made her own Tuca doll in the vein of Wrecker's Lula, which also gets kind of hinted on in episode two when it is shown a few times with Omega not being on board the Marauder. All right, episode two eggs. We had a return of a character from season one in Roland Duran. Remember, he tried to take Sid's shop on Ord Mantell. But we also finally got to see his mother, Isa Durand, who was voiced by Angelica Houston. So, nice little cameo there. Speaking of, I guess this is a true Easter egg, but look, there's text glasses. Hunter kept them, keeps them close by. All right, we got a rancid Joe Taz line from Wrecker when they're on that planet where the clone cadets were. And the Joe Taz were something you fought in Jedi Fallen Order. Staying on that planet, coming from the clone cadets, we hear about Base Delta Zero, which is kind of a, a code sign for we're going to nuke this planet. We're going to destroy this planet. And this actually was first mentioned, I believe, in Legends, but was uh, teased again in Star Wars Rebels in a few of the arcs with Sabine. And then uh, I mentioned it before, but how about Mox being voiced by Daniel Logan? But Deke and Stack, the other two clone cadets, they are voiced by Julian Dennison, who played Firehands from Deadpool 2. And our final egg in reference from the premiere here is Project Necromancer. Said, about, uh, said a lot about it already. Love that we got to see it. Uh, again, this was first mentioned in the Mandoverse, and we now know that it is directly tied to Palpatine's plans of immortality that's right people and it seems omega is going to be the key there but i have a feeling they're not going to get her considering they're still trying to figure out project Me uh, necromancer many many years in fact decades beyond the bad batch timeline as we heard in the mandoverse they're still working on it hey now bad batch is back new star wars is back so that means the star wars time show is back to break down everything live wednesday nights youtube.com slash star wars time show give us a sub set your notifications come join the stream and let's talk bad batch thanks for watching everyone please subscribe hit that button tell a friend we love you there's always time for star wars time don't forget if you listen to the star wars time show the force will be with you always yeah.